The Breakfast Club ought to be shame of itself for allowing Candace Owen to sit for one hour and spew a bunch of white supremacist talking points, misleading African Americans at this critical political juncture. But I'm going to refute those white supremacist talking points in this video. Stay tuned. Hello, everybody. I'm attorney Augustus Corbett, one half of the Defiant Lawyers. And each and every week, we bring you at least one legal analysis of some trending story having to do with politics, policies, personalities, or pop culture to empower you with the information you need to defy an unjust legal system and to nullify systemic racism. If that interests you, and I certainly hope it does, please like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell so that you will be notified every time we upload one of these powerful, informative videos. So again, I think the Breakfast Club should be ashamed of itself for allowing Candace Owens to sit and basically just, just put out all these, these white conservative, white supremacist talking points for over an hour with very little challenge, very little. You know, Charlemagne asked a few questions. Envy asked a few questions. Um, Jess Solarius said a couple of things, but no one took her to task for all the stuff that she was saying. Somebody has to do that. And you know it's my custom to go into the weeds, get down and dirty, to inform the African-American community about all of the, 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 the twisted, one-sided, White supremacists, and I'm going to, you're going to hear that term over and over and over again because that's what it is. What Candace Owens and a lot of the black conservatives are doing is basically just voicing white supremacy, white supremacists, talking points and grievances and half-truths and even outright lies. And I'm going to show you that. Now, why does the Breakfast Club do that? Well, for one reason. Money. Money. That is a for-profit radio station. I think it's iHeart Radio. They make money. Getting somebody like Candace Owen to come on their radio, their podcast, their television program with her, what, three and a half million followers as much as, as a lightning rod as she is, they know they're going to get viewers, right? So that's why they, that's why they did it. I don't, I don't get any donations or contributions or anything like that for what I'm saying, for what Chloe, my daughter, and I are saying on this channel. So I'm, I'm not doing it for that reason. I just hate to see our people being misled the way that Candace Owens and other black conservatives are trying to mislead our community into supporting Donald Trump who is a blatant white supremacist. You've heard me say it many times. And not only him, you always got to keep in mind who he brings with him. The people that he will bring into the government. People who are diametrically opposed to civil rights, to black progress, black advancement. They are diametrically opposed to you and I going up, advancing, and progressing. And so their agenda is simple, to make sure that we don't have the ability to progress, to advance as African-American people. That's their simple, very simple platform. That's their commitment. That's what they're dedicated to doing. All right? And I'm going to show you a lot of what Candace Owens said is just simply... Again, white supremacists, unsubstantiated talking points. That's it. She doesn't go, she doesn't bring receipts. She doesn't prove what she says. And that's the issue that I have with, with her going, being allowed to go on programs like Joe Budden and um, The Breakfast Club because those guys, with all due respect, this is not something that they have been 
a part of and studying uh, for years. So Candace Owens knows she can just sit there and just say all sorts of things. And that's what she did. And she's going to get very little pushback. And a lot of African-American people are going to be saying, well, she doesn't sound that bad. They have demonized her, but I, I don't think she sounds that bad. Not knowing, not going deeper to understand exactly what she's saying. And she was pretty upfront about where she stands, about Trump, about a number of things. Well, let's get into it because I'm going to refute a whole lot of that stuff in this particular video. All right, so Candace Owens is misleading black people. And by the way, we all know that she was recently let go by the Daily Wire or she quit or they fired her or the terminated her contract. I don't know what happened, but she confirmed that they are no longer, you know, doing things together. So I presume that she is about to really step it up on black media on behalf of Donald Trump, especially now that it seems that black media is willing to allow her to come on their air, their platform, and say the things that she said on The Breakfast Club. I, I don't know what she said on the Joe B Budden podcast because uh, I haven't watched it. I think you got to be a part of his Patreon um, community, and I'm not. But what she said on The Breakfast Club was just wild and crazy. Just wild and crazy. And again, without much challenge. Now, before we get into this, please go to Amazon and get a copy of my book, Education and Justice. If you have kids in the public school system, and by the way, she says some things about the public school system I do somewhat agree with, right? I'm very critical of the public school system as she was in this particular interview. And if you know how um, I you know, teach uh, when I'm doing these videos, then this book is pretty much the same. I give you a whole lot of information. I conducted a, a lot of research so that you're not just getting my opinions, you're getting studies, you're getting research, you're getting uh, the experts who are in this public education field so that you will be empowered to advocate for your son. Because I, I assure you, if your son, your black son is in public school, he's being mistreated and you may not even know about it because you don't know what you don't know, right? So go to Amazon, get a copy of my book. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you all for all the support that you've shown our channel. All right, so let's get into this. First thing, how Candace Owens became a black conservative and white supremacist. And I included white supremacists, quite frankly, you all, because you, you pretty much cannot be a black conservative without embracing white supremacy. I mean, they kind of go hand in hand. It's like heads and tails of the same coin. All right. In order for you to be embraced and promoted and appreciated by white conservatives, you must promote white supremacy. Or they're not, or they're going to take you off their platform, and that's sort of what we see happening with Candace and Daily Wire, the Daily Wire, right? Um, what Candace learned, what she found out was, you can take these cheap shots at Black Americans, right? You can attack George Floyd, you can attack BLM, you can do all that, but when you go out there, the Jewish community, there's going to be a price to pay because the Jewish community is much more influential than the African-American community. So they, they let her, they showed her, right? They showed her, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna express anti-Semitism uh, and be connected with us. So she, so she learned that. With us, she can take these shots, she can say the things that she said, even uh, to Charlemagne and Envy and Jess Hilarious, African-American people, Joe Budden, she, she had the gall, the nerve to say these things <laughs> to those African-Americans and to their African-American audiences. Now, <laughs> okay, let, let's, let's get into it. Let, let me just say this before I move on. A lot of the Breakfast Club and Joe Budden's audience 
a lot of them are young people, younger people, younger than me. I'm 62 years old. I've been around a minute. I was living during segregation. I remember black people having to go to the back of the restaurant. I remember there being two doors into the doctor's offices, one for blacks and one for whites. I remember this stuff. The younger people don't remember that. Some of you all lived eight years under the first black president, and now there's a, a, a black female president. You all think just because of your age and you don't have the, 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 the historical knowledge that a lot of us uh, old school folks have, you all therefore think, you know, things are okay. You know, things are okay. And they are much better than they used to be. But it's, it's because, why are they better? Because of the work of my generation and the generation before me and the generation before it, and, and you go on back. And, and you all should not be fooled by these black conservatives and allow white supremacists to roll back to, what do they call it? To make America great again. They tell you right in that slogan what they're up to. And just common sense lets you know that making America great again takes us back to a time when things were horrible for African-American people. When Trump spoke to the black conservative group a couple of weeks ago and insulted black folks, black people, even he knew he couldn't say make America great again with, with that crowd. Although that crowd, they don't, they don't care. But it was striking that he said, well, maybe we can't use a, make America great again with, with the black audience. But they, again, they didn't care. But the point is, the irony is, He's absolutely right. Making America great again means making America racist, deeply, deeply racist, segregated and all that for African-Americans. And you all cannot be the generation to allow them to do this. So study history. Almost so many of what videos that I do are really history lessons to try to connect you with our history so that you understand where we are and what's ahead and how to plan for it. All right? Now, so I'm not going to play any of the videos and or any of the video any any portion of the video that of the Breakfast Club video because I'm concerned that YouTube will will strike our channel and you know and and penalize us in some way. Um, so I'm not going to do that. I've used iHeart video in the past, and there was definitely a copyright strike. But I got something even better, actually. I have the transcript. This is portions of the actual transcript. So we can see exactly what came out of Candace's mouth, exactly what she said. All right. And another thing, Candace is young, too. Candace is only, I think, like 34 years old. And she recently became a conservative. That's one of the things that we're going to look at here, right? How Candace Owens became a black conservative and white supremacist. So she says, she tells us, she says, I feel like I landed in the politics kind of accidentally. And I say accidentally because I was, I thought I was a liberal my whole life, you know. I thought I was on the left my whole life and really didn't pay attention to politics in any meaningful way. And then, you know, when Trump was running for office, I didn't want him to be elected. I was like this, not I was like this, not because I thought he was a racist or a sexist. Well, that tells me a lot right there that she didn't think he was a sexist or a racist when the man is on the record saying that, you know, saying racist things and sexist things. Right. But just because I thought it was crazy to go from Obama, who had a certain decorum about him to suddenly this sort of brash New Yorker. But I thought it was weird when all of a sudden the people that liked Trump, you know, everyone thought it, he was like this iconic symbol, symbol of business. He was in rap songs. Everybody, you know, Trump was a status flipped on him in one second. I just didn't I didn't buy the narrative that he was in the media for three, uh, four decades. And suddenly you wanted me to believe overnight that he was like Adolf Hitler and a racist. So I just didn't trust the media's narrative about him. Well, you don't have to trust the media. All you got to do is do some homework and you'll find among other things, that in the 70s, Trump was sued by the federal government 
for discrimination against black folks not wanting to rent them apartments in his in his father's businesses. That's documented. That's not a media narrative. That's not a left or liberal narrative. Those are facts. And those are just a few facts. When he came down the escalator and announced himself, announced his candidacy, he, he said some very racist things about Mexicans. We know how he treated Obama with that birtherism crap. So, the, and, and of course, the, the Central Park Five, those five men of color that he wanted executed for allegations that, that turned out to be false. So, so we know, we know based on facts that the man is a racist. And we also know John Kelly, his former uh, chief of staff, has come out and said that Trump, in their private conversations, spoke very highly of, of Adolf Hitler. That he said other anti-Semitic things. <laughs> so we don't, it's not a, a media narrative, people close to him. And his own business practices show us who, who Trump is. And so I decided to actually listen to what he said, and I still didn't vote for him in 2016, but I wanted to just listen to what he actually said. And then when I saw what he was saying versus how it was being reported, I just found it to be extremely dishonest. So I started researching more, learning more, and mm, then I got ain't kind of angry, just like with the lies, because... There were no lies. The man was as racist as the media was reporting. I was like, do, do uh, the media think black Americans are intentionally m uh, manipulated? Let me go back and read that. Uh, because I do think black Americans are intentionally manipulated emotionally by the media and, you know, kind of kept dumb by emotionally, uh, in intentionally by the school system. Blacks are kept dumb. So she thinks blacks are dumb. I mean, did you all catch that? She thinks we, blacks, are dumb. And she is black. So is she, or she, is she saying that she's dumb and her family uh, is dumb and her black friends are dumb? Um, I mean, she said that <laughs> kind of kept dumb. Kept means she thinks we are already dumb, and the school system keeps us dumb. I, I don't believe blacks are dumb. I know we're not dumb. I, I know we're not. I have much more respect for myself and my ethnicity than what Candace had to say here. But anyway, she says, I started reading up on, like, Thomas Sowell, Shelby Steele, I don't, a, a bunch of other black scholars. I don't know if you know these men. Thomas Sowell, Shelby Steele are black conservative scholars, professors. Thomas Sowell is, a, is an older black guy. Uh, Shelby Steele, I have read Shelby Steele's book, White Guilt. I've read some of Thomas Sowell's um, material. Uh, and they're not the only two. Um, there's also um, Walter Williams. He passed a few years ago. He was a professor um, in D.C., there is also Glenn Lowry, an economist, a black conservative, and there are others. But she began to start listening to these guys, and they are definitely black conservatives. And I think that they are completely wrong on most of what they have to say. They absolve white supremacy, they embrace white supremacy, and they pretty much lay at the feet of black Americans everything that is wrong with black Americans. Because in their mind, slavery is over, therefore it, it has no impact on black Americans. And I can tell you that that is false. Even the U.S. Supreme Court knows that that is false. There is something in, in one of the cases called the badges and incidents of slavery. In other words, the, the residue of slavery. Now, just by saying that, Shelby Steele, Thomas Sowell, Candace Owen, who she's feeding on, will say that that's victimology. For us to simply say that 246 years of slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow, modern day systemic racism is victimology. What is the effect of that? The effect of that is to shame blacks and to absolve white supremacists. 
In other words, white supremacists continue to do what you're doing, continue to uh, promote systemic racism and to practice systemic racism and white supremacy, because we're going to be out here telling black people that they are victimologists when they acknowledge the very obvious, the obvious fact that that slavery still impacts our community. Jim Crow laws, we dismantled um, de jure Jim Crow laws, laws that were actually enacted during Jim Crow, like, like you know, c- convict leasing and sharecropping and that sort of thing. But there is de facto Jim Crow, systemic racism. It is the reason why we have disparities across systems in America, healthcare disparities. Why do black women, why do black babies die disproportionately during childbirth? Why, why, why is that? Why does the public school system fail African-American uh, males and females? Why? Because of disparities. Why do the average white family have 10 times more wealth than the average black family? Because of systemic racism and because of a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow that has never been dealt with. And the way I believe to really deal with 400 years of racial oppression, the best way are reparations. Reparations. But anyway, um, Candace Owens and that black conservative crowd that she is feeding on, they are really the mouthpiece of white supremacists because whites know they can't say a lot of the stuff that Candace says. Think about a white person coming out and attacking George Floyd the way Candace Owens did. Oh, they would be, you know, just accused of being a racist and set aside and and condemned, et cetera. But who's going to say much of anything to Candace Owens, especially when she say those kinds of things about blacks? Now, she learned you cannot get away with saying things like that, disparaging things about the Jewish community, but you can about blacks. Are you with me? All right, so that's how she became a conservative, and th- that's been in the last decade. You know, Trump came down that escalator, was, was, it, was it 2015? So that's been like within the last decade. Like I said, she's a young woman. She's only 34 years old. Okay, let's keep moving. Why Candace Owens like Trump? She told us. Well, no, no, I actually like, once I actually heard what he had to say, I was like, that's a pretty good pitch, pretty solid pitch. I mean, it was his uh, Demondale, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Michigan speech particularly. He got up there and he just started listing all the statistics in black America in terms of poverty. I mean, there were just real statistics that he was talking about and his pitch was basically like, you've been giving your vote to Democrats for 60 years, why don't you just try something different? And we all know that is not what Trump said, nor how he said it. He said, your schools are no good. Your neighborhoods are no good. Basically inferring, you all are no good. So, what you got to lose? What you got to lose? I mean, it was a horrible way to ask people for their votes. And it was revealing to talk to us like that. To talk in that tone of voice and to say those disparaging things like that. And besides, not all African Americans are living the way that he was referencing. I think he was he was giving this speech having to do with Detroit. And Detroit has some bad areas and some bad parts of town and and some issues. But he took every opportunity, not just with Detroit, but Baltimore. You remember he said some very horrible things about Baltimore, as well as Atlanta and Africa, Haiti. I mean, he has a very, very low opinion of black people. And that came out in his pitch that that Candace was okay with. Because the more and more and more you feed on that black, conservative, white supremacist, the more you feed on those talking points, the more sort of colder your heart becomes toward black people, 
toward your own people. I mean, you start becoming desensitized. You start losing touch with the black community. We saw that, right, sort of in a, <laughs> in a, in a kind of a funny way at the end of that, at the end of that uh, Breakfast Club interview, where, you know, they said to her, for example, God is good, and she didn't know that commonly in the black community, you know, the response is all the time. And then all the time, God is good. It's, all, it's like a call and response in church. You know, the preacher stands up, the, the black preacher stands up and says, God is good. And the church just knows to say all the time. And the preacher may come back with an all the time. Church says God is good. She didn't know that. She knew nothing about, <laughs> she knew nothing about that. Okay. And so the more one feeds, the more a black person feeds on that white supremacy, the more they get pulled into that black conservative world and start losing touch with the black community. And that's where she is. That's, that's, that's where she is. That's where a lot of blacks are, especially black conservatives. So that was a horrible pitch. That was not a solid, responsible pitch. It was, it was absolutely horrible for him to talk about us in that way. As I was saying, not all African-Americans live in the kinds of neighborhoods that he was referring to. All right, so let's keep moving. I want to make sure I hit the main points here. All right. All right, so the next section of the interview that I want to address, uh, did Candace say racism doesn't exist? I dug up, unlike what Candace says we black folks do, I actually dug up that video and I listened to it myself. And Candace did not outright say that racism doesn't exist. And to be fair to her on this point, what she did say, I agreed with. I agree with it, although she came at it from a different place than I. Essentially, she said, and she was talking to Democrats, uh, and, you know, and another problem I had with what she said is she said this to basically an all-white conservative audience, right, um, which is problematic. That's problematic by itself. But anyway, she said and was basically speaking to Democrats, don't, you know, use racism to try to destroy our, self, uh, our self-confidence. Uh, she went on to say that, um, you know, she has never been a slave, um, essentially saying that racism is not insurmountable. And I agree with that. I never allowed racism to stop me from from growing from a high school dropout to uh, a, a licensed attorney, uh, a, a minister. Uh, we didn't raise our children that way. So I agree that racism should not be an excuse for black failure. Now, that's because of the work of men like Martin Luther King, of, of, of men like Thurgood Marshall, of women like Fannie Lou Hamer, of, of, of countless others, Mega Evers, people who died and, and, and worked <clears throat> to give us the rights that we have. So she, you know, wouldn't say that, but I have no problem absolutely acknowledging and appreciating the fact that we stand on the shoulders of, of Rosa Parks of, of uh, so, so many others, uh, Ralph Abernathy, um, Joseph Lowry. I mean, I could go on and on and on of the shoulders that we stand on because back during that day, back, for example, when my father was my age, back in the 20s and 30s. Oh, man. And even before that, yeah, racism, white supremacy, segregation, slavery, absolutely would prevent black people from being successful. But not today. Today, what we're fighting for is full equality. We're fighting for full equality. And we're fighting to maintain the progress that we've made. 
because the GOP, Donald Trump, MEGA, Project 2025, Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller, and all that whole crowd, the Federalist Society, the Heritage Foundation, the Manhattan Institute, um, uh, Christopher Rufo, Edward Bloom, they're out here, the Supreme Court, the six uh, conservatives on the court, many uh, governors of many states, of red states, uh, folks in Congress, they're all trying to turn back the hands of time and take us back. And Candace is trying to get you to support those people that I just mentioned. Don't you be bamboozled. Don't you be misled by her effervescent personality, by her uh, articulation. She's very articulate. Don't be bamboozled. Don't be misled by any of that. I don't care who embraces her and lets her on their platform. I don't care if Charlemagne or Joe Budden, I could care less who allows her to come and spew her white supremacist talking points. Don't you be fooled. She and Trump are the tip of the spear, a very anti-black, anti-civil rights spear. Don't be fooled. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So again, she didn't say that there's no racism, but she was basically saying that racism is no problem today. I'm definitely not saying that. I am saying, again, we can overcome it, but we want full equality, right? And we're not going to dismiss the fact that systemic racism is very much active in our country, very much. And we shouldn't have to, on every hand, fight this systemic racism. Um, for example, to listen at this. African-Americans own less than 3% of this nation's wealth after 400 years. That is due to systemic inequality, historical systemic inequality that dates all the way back to slavery when they failed to give us the promised 40 acres, when they pr 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 prohibited us, kept us from taking advantage of the Homestead Act, when they took land that we acquired after slavery, I mean a lot of land, when they just took it and, and, and used discrimination to, to, to swindle us out of this property. All of that is the reason why our communities experience concentrated poverty the way they do. Has nothing to do with black culture. Has nothing to do with um, even things like the fact that 72% of our, of our children are born out of wedlock. Now, don't misunderstand me. We need to work on that. We need to change that because children do need to be born in marriage so that they can have both a father and a mother bringing in that income, providing, helping rear that child. Absolutely. But here's my point. My point is 100% of our children could be born uh, in marriage, all of us could get college degrees, all of us could save money, all of us could could do all the right things, and it would not close this, this gap, this wealth gap that has existed in this country since 1619. And again, the only way I see closing that gap is with reparations. Now, while I'm talking about reparations, I, I see people all the time saying, yeah, that's why I'm not going to vote unless they agree to reparations. I don't know if that is some Russian robot. I've actually heard some black YouTubers say that. That is foolishness. <laughs> to say, I'm going to vote the couch, I'm going to let Trump come in, I'm going to let Project 2025, I'm going to just do nothing to help keep them out of office because the Democrats 
haven't gotten me any reparations. It's ridiculous. That is, that is, that's irrational. That, that's irrational. That, that defies common sense. That defies common sense. Good luck getting reparations from Project 2025. At least the Democrats have proposed once again and have done so for, for 40 years, proposed reparations in every Congress. No GOP member has ever done that. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, I, that's why a lot of times when I read that type of comment, I, I just must conclude this must be a GOP or Russian bot to say something that nonsensical, that asinine. All right? So I'm a strong supporter of reparations, but I am not going to just sit back with my arms folded and not vote and not participate and not push this, this country toward black progress because— we haven't gotten reparations yet. We're just going to keep fighting for it. All right, let's move on. So although Candace didn't say racism doesn't exist, here's some things that she has said that I want to remind you that she said. She said, quote, I don't care about Charlottesville where the Nazis were marching and, you know, out there saying Jews will not replace us where they actually killed a young white woman who was fighting against Nazis and so on. Th that's Charlottesville. She said, I don't care about Charlottesville, where Trump also said the, the, concerning Charlottesville that they were fine people, the Nazis. I don't care about Charlottesville, the KKK, or white supremacy, close quote. That's not a woman we need to listen to. That's, that's not... That's not an African-American woman you all need to listen to. I'm not going to listen to her. <laughs> I've, I've been through too much and seen too much. to. I, I know better. But again, you young people who don't have the benefit of history, you may, you may give space to that. Well, let me just take some advice from me, okay, an old schooler. Any black person who says I'm not concerned about white supremacy is not a friend. That's not a friend. That person is bringing some junk to the table. What else did she say or do? We all remember how she denigrated George Floyd and black people for supporting him. Who cares that George Floyd had a criminal record? What the man also had was he was an image bearer of of God. He was made in God's image. His life was as valuable as anyone else. And he should not have, have been lynched. And that's what that was. He should not have been lynched out there, especially because he allegedly tried to pass a fake $20 bill. I represented many people in the criminal court system. And trust me, the penalty and punishment for being found guilty of trying to pass a fake $20 bill is a misdemeanor, okay, that probably carries probation or something, not the death penalty, not getting the life choked out of you. So it wasn't about George Floyd. But what was Candace really doing out there? Let me, let me explain this to you. You remember all the protesting? And a great number of the people protesting were white people. In fact, protesting occurred, peaceful protesting. There was some times where uh, things got out of hand, and some of that could have been because of white supremacists all in the crowd. But protesting occurred around the world. And this country was like, okay, is this a racial reckoning moment? Is this a moment for America to take a serious look for white conservatives, for the Republican Party, the GOP, to take a serious look at the legacy of systemic injustices against black Americans. Well, those GOP, those white conservatives, those white supremacists looked to black conservatives for the answer. 
And what did black conservatives like Candace Owens say to them? No, this is not a racial reckoning moment because George Floyd had a criminal record. And so that's all white supremacists and white conservatives needed to hear. A black person say it's okay because George Floyd had a criminal record. Now, Candace did say, you know, somewhere in there that she wanted George Floyd's family to get justice. And if you also remember, um, the family of George Floyd considered bringing some legal actions because of the way things were said about George Floyd. I think Kanye West was involved in some of that. But the real point of her coming out so strongly against George Floyd and BLM was to say to white people that, no, this is not a racial reckoning moment. Carry on. And that's all they needed. They were, in their minds, off the hook. Thank God the legal system worked, and Derek Chauvin and his colleagues were all held accountable for choking the life out of George Floyd. Let's take a moment of silence for him because, again, his life was valuable. Thank you. What else she say? She excused and diminished slavery in a Prager U video, five minute video. My daughter Chloe is going to do a critique of that video. We should have that uploaded in a day or two. And the things that she says about slavery, folks, this is not somebody that we should be embracing. We should not be embracing this woman. You can go listen to the video yourself. Just go to Prager U YouTube channel and find Candace's video. It's a five minute video on slavery and the way she just spins it is awful. She said, quote, based on the hierarchy of what's impacting minority Americans, if I had to make a list of a hundred things, white nationalism would not make the list. White supremacy and white nationalism is not a problem that is harming black America. Bull. Bull. What about the six police officers who just were sent to prison for torturing two black men? What about that? What about the white supremacists who went to the church in Charleston, South Carolina and murdered nine people? What about the guy who traveled from Ohio, I believe, to Buffalo, New York, just to kill 10 black folks. And those are just anecdotes. Those are just anecdotes. In other words, just the small examples of the, of the systemic racism that African Americans face every day. How do I know? Because one of the things our law practice does is we practice civil rights law. So we're actually in the courtrooms fighting for African-American civil rights that are being abused every day. Many of you call our office, and so many times, sadly, we cannot help because we either don't, don't practice in your area or it's not the type of case that we practice, but we feel your pain, and we know your pain is real. So Candace is just... One wonders, why does she do this? And now we're going to open our hearts, our platforms to her. We would be crazy to do that. She said, quote, but if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. There's nothing fine about Hitler. The problem is, is that he had dreams outside of Germany I don't really have a problem with nationalism. No, the problem is, the problem is, he was a, geno, a, a, geno, a genocidal, maniacal, tyrannical demon who murdered six million people. That, that, that was the problem. He murdered six million people. Let's be clear about that. He murdered six million Jewish people people. 
It seems like we get confused about that sometimes. Some of these conservatives, even black conservatives, I, I don't understand that. I don't understand the anti-Semitism when the Jewish community has been uh, helpful in our fight against racism. Now, I, I'm I'm not naive. I know that there are Jewish people out there who are racist and bigoted and 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 hate black people. I, I know that. But I'm talking about the Jewish community as a whole. As a whole. Okay? All right. Yeah, Hitler was a bad dude, Candace. Not just because he wanted to take whatever you whatever you're saying. Whatever. Whatever whatever you're trying to articulate here. All right. Is Biden or Trump better for black America? This is what Charlemagne asked Candace. And let's look at Candace's answer, and then let's look at the facts. She said, in terms of the better candidate for black Americans, I ask people the question, how are you living under Trump? The person that they told you was going to put us back into chains, and we were all going to be slaves again. How was the economy under Trump, and how are you doing today? And every time you ask that question, everyone knows that they were living better under Trump because he was deregulating um, the, the environment. Well, let me tell you something. There should be some regulation on the environment because when they want to build a dump, where do they build it? In the black community. When they want a bunch of toxins escaping some factory in the city, where do they build it? In the black community. That's environmental racism. And the EPA is there. And by the way, one of my um, college uh, alums is now running the EPA. Shout out to A&T uh, there in Greensboro. But environmental racism is real, and it has a, hu a, a huge impact on the black community. I just want to throw that in. So let's actually look at what the data says about how blacks uh, fared under Trump versus how blacks fare are faring today under Biden. Let's look at it. Forget my opinion. Let's look at the facts. And let's begin with unemployment, black unemployment. If you look at the two dots, well, first of all, you see Trump, there's that beige color from 2017 to 2021, and then Biden from 21 forward. If you look at the black dots on on the far ends of this graph, that black dot where when Trump was president, all right, and then travel over and you see the graph drops down under Trump's presidency, black unemployment, to just over 5%. All right? And that, you know, black unemployment is always higher than white unemployment, but that that's that's good. That that's that was good. Okay? So I'm not saying that, that I'm not saying that black unemployment was horrible under Trump. I am saying, as this graph shows, it's better under Biden. So come over to the light blue, and you'll see that in 2023, unemployment dropped below 5% for blacks. And even now, it's lower than the lowest point for Trump. There it is. So black unemployment has been the lowest in American history under Biden, and it's, it's lower now than at any time during the Trump administration. So when Candace says, how were you doing under Trump versus how are you doing under Biden? Here's the answer. But let's not stop there. There's more. Average monthly job creation. If you look at Trump's term, job creation was below, consistently below 250. And then, of course, COVID hit and the whole bottom just fell out of everything. Now, and by the way, some of that is the result. And I got to be very clear about this. Some of that, all that, you know, happened during COVID is the result of how Trump mishandled COVID, lying about COVID, trying to play down COVID, missing golden opportunities 
to fight COVID. And as a result of that, many, 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 many people died needlessly, disproportionately black and Hispanics under Trump. So the economy didn't have to tank the way it did had that man not committed what I would consider to be malfeasance in his handling of COVID. I I just got to say that. His own COVID response coordinator, I think her name was Deborah Burks, Deborah Burke, Burks. She said that nearly 500,000 of the million or so Americans who died, 500,000 didn't have to. But Trump put politics above COVID. We saw him do it. We saw him discourage masks. We saw him, although the vaccine was created during his administration, we saw him and the GOP discourage vaccinations, which caused people to die. With this anti-science, anti-vaccine foolishness. All right. Now, if we look at job creation during Biden, 2021, through the roof. 2022, much better than anything Trump did. Even his lowest at 2023, still better than Trump. So, Candace, when you say things were better under Trump, not according to the data. This is not my data. This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this is the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics as well. So this is not my data. This is not something I created. All right? Spending power. Spending power under black uh, under by Trump, pardon me, 2017. You see where that graph is. Now go all the way over to the far end under Biden and look how much it rose. Spending power. Where is that from? The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. More black people working. More jobs. More spending power under Biden than under Trump. Candace, let's 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 <laughs> let, let's let's tell the truth about this, okay? Stock market performance through the roof. This means a lot of people made a lot of money under Biden. A lot of people made a lot of money in the stock market. I hope that some of those people, and I'm sure some of them uh, are black and made a lot of money. I mean, there it is. Where's this from? The S&P Dow Jones uh, 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 released that information. Look at that. These are the facts. These are not talking points. These are facts that undermine Candace Owens and white conservatives' talking points. And then, regarding black business creation, one of the biggest complaints from from blacks who who, want to start and grow businesses is getting the financing. Candace Owens mentioned that how important financing is with business and starting businesses. Well, under Trump, there were a lot of blacks who could not get SBA loans. Look at Biden. It started rising the moment he came in office. And look at where it is now. A whole lot more black business owners, entrepreneurs are getting the money they need and not still not enough, but getting much more than they were getting under Trump. The same is true with the actual dollars and millions that blacks are getting. And the percent of black business owners getting money. Look at all that. 2021, 2022, 2023, all greater than anything Trump, uh, anything that happened under the Trump administration. So, Candace, 
You you make those false uh, claims that folks did better under 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 um, Trump, but it's not true. Now, of course, we know, and we and we have to say this: that inflation is still too high, home prices is still too high, car prices is still too high. But we just came out of this this pandemic, and things are going back going back toward normal, but they're not there yet. And Biden and Harris need to continue doing all they can, all they can, so that inflation comes down, interest rates come down. The feds here this last quarter did not lower interest rates, but they indicated there would be three, um, they would do so three times in, I, I presume, the next three quarters of 2024. But, you, you know, the feds have to be really careful because if they if they lower interest rates too low, then inflation is going to start creeping back up. So so they got to do it. You know, they got to do it at the right time and in the right amount. OK. Now, let's look at. She had things to say about immigration, LBJ, and the Great Society. Okay, let's talk about that. Because she said some 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 racist stuff here. Something that they were that they worked so hard for is not going to matter. They get enough illegals in, and she says, "What are we at? Ten million under Biden, and they're doing it intentionally. Like it's going to be the same thing that they did to Black Americans in the '60s." What Lyndon Beans Johnson did when he established welfare. By the way, Lyndon Johnson didn't establish welfare. That was Roosevelt in the 30s. Anyway, like when he did when he established welfare, as in the Great Society Act, they want to get these people in, offer them handouts, and turn them into economic slaves that will continue to vote for Democrats because they're getting free handouts. That is the common theme amongst white and black conservatives. That blacks support the Democratic Party because of welfare. Now, they don't say not one doggone thing about the corporate welfare that Republicans give rich people like the $2 trillion tax cut that went to rich people. They don't say anything about that. And it's not true that blacks support the Democratic Party to get a check. That is insulting. That's offensive. I mean, anecdotally, there may be people out there, I'm sure there are people out there who... um, are so lazy and and without any ambition and so forth that they wait for a five or six hundred dollar check welfare check a month. Uh, that that's few and far between. Uh, uh, with with African American people, come on, we spend a trillion dollars in this in this country. I mean, th- that's again just white supremacist rhetoric, garbage, racism. And she goes on to say some really uh, crazy stuff about Lyndon Baines Johnson. Um, And it's incredibly racist, first and foremost, but because black Americans are still, a lot of black Americans, I should say, are still living under Baines Johnson was a good president, even though he wasn't, even though he wasn't a vile racist. I think she meant even though he was a vile racist. I mean, he hated black people. I mean, one of the uh, so many times, I mean, hard R referring to us as the N word. So she goes in on Lyndon Baines Johnson. And you have heard me say that the president in my lifetime that did the most to help African-Americans go up was Lyndon Baines Johnson. Why? Because of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. The Fair Housing Act. He signed those into law. Kansas City had to be forced to. Yes, he's a politician. 
So, yes, he did have to be pushed into doing it. But we also have recordings of him twisting arms of Southern conservatives that Candace is linked up with now to support the Civil Rights Act of 64. As a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, April 4th, we will remember the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And for that matter, you know, if you talk about whether Lyndon Johnson was a racist, yes, he, he definitely used the N-word as reported. And even Kennedy was not enthusiastically in support of the civil rights movement. He got that, that, that reputation because uh, when Dr. King was, was, was locked up, he called uh, Miss Coretta Scott King and, and gave her well wishes for Dr. King. You know, in the video I did about the Southern strategy, I showed you, I documented and showed you that those Dixiecrats who were in the Democrat, Democratic Party, they all bolted, left the Democratic Party because of Lyndon Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act. That, that really pushed them into the Republican Party, the party that had worked to free the slaves, the radical Republican Party. And it's those people that left the, those racist, white supremacist Dixiecrats who left the Democratic Party, went into the GOP party that Candace now supports and wants back in office. Let's keep it real. We're, I'm not going to let her, if you listen to my, I'm not going to let her just, just put this stuff out there and someone not bring some context to it. So was Lyndon Baines Johnson, did he use the N-word? Yes. But he also, he also, and one thing I recall uh, him doing was after Dr. King was assassinated, he gave a speech, I believe it was at Howard University, where he said in his speech, we shall overcome. And he talked to his fellow Southerners and said, it's time for us to change this, for us to really um, do right with, with, with black people. And so he signed it into law. So no, 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 no. I don't want to hear this stuff about, about Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Democratic Party has done nothing, have done nothing for black Americans. I, I, I don't, I don't, look, we don't need the Democratic Party to come in, take our hand and walk us, you know, through. That's not what we need. We just need for both parties, right, to don't pass laws, don't make policies that are discriminatory toward black people. Don't do as the GOP is currently trying to do, undermine the Civil Rights Act as they already did gutting the Voting Rights Act, that's what we don't need. And it's Candace's party that is currently doing that. We just need the Democratic Party to do what it's doing, push policies and um, regulations and laws and so forth that, that open the door for us. As James Brown said, you open the door, I'll get it for myself. We don't, we don't need the Democratic Party, I, it kind of irks me when I hear some blacks saying the Democratic Party has, 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 hasn't done anything for blacks as if to say, my life is all busted up right now because the Democratic, Party's, Democratic Party hasn't done anything for me. That sounds kind of dependent upon the Democratic Party. That's not what I'm advocating. We don't need the Democratic Party to come and take our hand. Or the, or the Republican Party. And by the way, I'm not Republican or Democrat. We don't need in, either one. We're going to do what we got to do regardless of who's in office. But we don't need one of those parties working against us like the GOP is currently doing. All right. Okay, so I'm coming to a close this is an hour and 11 minutes. I want to say something about welfare because it is a very popular topic.
talking point for the GOP, for white and black conservatives to say things like it is the the the, the liberal LBJ uh, welfare program that has driven black men out of the family and has made black people dependent upon welfare, has made black women dependent upon welfare. That is the low opinion that Candace Owens has for the black community. That's what they push, and they've been pushing it for 50 years. Longer than that, but a good, solid 50 years they've been saying that stuff. Well, I'm going to debunk that. And I'm going to do it real fast. Just stay with me. I'm going to show you a report that was issued by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. This report is dated August 4th. 2021, the TANF policies reflect racist legacy of cash assistance. TANF is basically uh, welfare today. So I'm going to jump to several highlighted areas, if you will, and I want you to understand some things that white and black conservatives hide and lie about. New Deal and Aid to Dependent Children, Excluding Black Women from Social Insurance. The creation of Aid to Dependent Children, ADC, renamed Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, in 1962. As part of the 1935 Social Security Act marked the beginning of the federal government's ongoing role in providing cash assistance to children in poverty. But ADC and other New Deal relief and work programs excluded many black and brown people. So first of all, let's understand that. Welfare was not created for black people. Welfare, when Roosevelt and the Democratic Party, which at that time was was filled with Dixiecrats, when they created these social programs during the Great Depression, they were not thinking about black people. Black people could barely get welfare. That's, that's the first thing I want you to realize. They did not have black people in mind when they created welfare, Social Security, and, and any of the rest of that. Okay? For example, policymakers originally designed unemployment insurance and retirement insurance primarily to support white male breadwinners. Even though unemployment was extremely high among black workers, up to 80% in some places as of 1932, the new unemployment insurance program explicitly excluded agricultural and domestic workers, which is where most black people worked at that time. The sectors where most black women worked. Social Security's retirement insurance excluded agriculture and domestic workers as well. As a result, 90% of black women laborers were initially ineligible for these social insurance programs, and two-thirds of black women workers were still ineligible a full decade later. It was white people, white women, white men benefiting from these government programs, and they still largely benefit from these programs. Okay, let me, I got more that I could go through here, but, all right. As a result, the Great Depression pushed more black families who were already struggling under exploitive work conditions, discrimination, and segregation, deeper into poverty. They were already putting up with hell, basically in a a de facto slave system. And then the Depression hit, and when the government... The Democratic Party created programs for poor people. They excluded blacks. So don't get this notion from Candace Owens and other black and white conservatives that blacks benefited from these programs. All right, let's look at, let's drop down a little further here. Look at this, look at the second paragraph. It says, Policymakers in a number of states criticized the types of families receiving ADC and the program's rising cost and implemented P 
punitive policies that disproportionately harmed black families. So even when black families started to gradually be able to get some assistance from these programs, they created policies to yet exclude, exclude blacks. Who did that? The white racist conservatives in the Democratic Party who did what? Went over into the GOP party that Candace is a part of. So-called suitable home and man in the house rules kicked off or denied initial access to mothers who engaged in activity deemed morally or sexually deviant. These women um, were denied access to these programs because of something, a policy called suitable home. Their, their, their home has to be, had to be suitable in the eyes of these white supremacists. And there couldn't be a man in the house. <laughs> okay, Candace Owens and other black and white conservatives who say that the Democratic uh, Party created policies that drove black men out of the family. But what they don't tell you is the people who did that were those Dixiecrat white conservatives, white supremacists who are now in the GOP. They don't tell you that. They think you don't know that it was the same white conservatives who are now in the GOP that were in the Democratic Party who were kicking black men out of the house. <laughs> they don't think you know that. They don't think you're going to dig and find that information. Well, you got me. All right. And I know how to dig. I know where to find it. And I'm going to inform you. That's the commitment of our channel to conform to, to in, inform you about these programs. So let me, again, I want you to understand that the man in the house policies, those rules, they were implemented. They were created and implemented by white conservatives who were at that time in the democratic party, but they left and became a part of the GOP, the Republican Party. I showed you that. Go watch the video that I did about the Southern strategy. That's all factual. Now, let's scroll down. I want you to see this map. So, suitable home requirements in many states denied ADC access, especially in the South. So, it was Southern states. Southern states that, that implemented and created these policies for the most part. So these, what today we call red states, which are filled with a lot of white supremacists, a lot of white conservatives who are today Republicans, they were the ones who were enforcing this man in the house policy, that rule, and running black men out of black families by essentially saying the mother and the children couldn't get any aid as long as there was a black man in the family. It was not, it was not the people who run the Democratic Party today, those white progressives and liberals, it was not them. It was the white conservatives who are in the GOP party who created and implemented the rules that kicked black men out of black families. Let's go back. All right, now. Okay, once again, you see those red states down there. Those were the states that were kicking men out the house. And this was during the time that white conservatives were in the Democratic Party. Now, we read here, men in the house or substitute fathers or substitute father. Laws cut aid to families if the mother cohabitated with a man who was not the children's father. So if there was a man in the house 
he had to leave. He had to go. They were based on the assumption that the man could or should provide for the children if he had no legal obligation to the child, was a casual romantic partner, had little or no income, or was simply a boarder. Who implemented those policies and created them? White conservatives. White conservatives. And there's something else I want to show you. Have you ever heard that black women had a habit of having more children just to get more, a bigger check? That's a lie. Some black women did that, like some white women did that. But widespread, that's a lie. Here's what this report says. All right, this report says conservative intellectuals. What type of intellectuals? Conservatives, intellectuals, and think tanks such as the Heritage Foundation and American Enterprise Institute push for dramatic cuts in anti-poverty programs. For, for example, scholars like Charles Mary, the man who said that blacks were intellectually inferior to whites, and Lawrence Mead, who had both made racist arguments about the inferiority or, uh, of black and Latin X people faulted AFDC and other programs for reinforcing a culture of poverty, especially among communities of color. Mary blamed and poverty, Mary blamed anti-poverty programs for the decline of the traditional nuclear family and the rise of, of births to unmarried mothers, particularly uh, black mothers, always black mothers. He recommended eliminating FDC for non-disabled adults and insisted they work regardless of job quality or, comp or compensation. Echo and Southern policymakers' efforts to preserve the black low-wage labor force in the early 20th century. In other words, kick them off welfare for whatever reason so that the South always has these black folks who are forced to get out there and work for a little bit of nothing or no compensation. Goes on to say, Meade did not go as far as calling for ending the program, but instead argued for more paternalism and control of AFDC families and that parents should be required to meet social obliga obligations like work to receive assistance. First of all, black folks did the work in this country when whites didn't want to do it and didn't do it. Always can't understand why whites love to try to create the narrative that blacks are lazy when blacks did the work and whites refused to work. Literally enslaved people to do their work. Yet it's blacks who are lazy. Anyway, yet contemporary research did not support the thesis that programs like AFDC led to increased rates of black children born outside of marriage. In other words, welfare did not increase black children born outside of marriage. That is a white supremacist lie. Yet a whole lot of black people believe it. Based on anecdotes, meaning of course we can go to, uh, we all know some folks who may do something like that. Or based on images we see in the media. But the research debunks that white supremacist talking point that Candace Owens and other conservatives use against black women, especially. Let me read it again. Contemporary research did not support the thesis, the lies that programs like AFDC led to increased rates of black children born outside of marriage. A 1984 report by social policy researchers David Elwood and Mary Jo Bain found no connection between state benefit levels 
and the rates of children born outside of marriage. Other studies supported this finding. And as noted, the real value of benefits started uh, declining in the 70s, even as rates of children born outside of marriage rose. In other words, while the people were getting off welfare, the children born outside of wedlock, it continued to rise. And, and let me just make this, this very obvious observation. Because white women, because white people make up the majority of this country, most people on welfare are white. And this ends by saying, welfare simply does not appear to be the underlying cause of the dramatic changes in family structure of the past few decades, Elwood and Bain concluded. That undermines that whole false narrative that welfare is the reason that black women have a bunch of children out of wedlock. Candace Owens was given an hour to sit there and mislead African-American people. And I'll say it again. The Breakfast Club should be a shame of itself. I tell you what, I guarantee you, Michael Eric Dyson, someone of that, you know, academic stature who would strongly advocate for the African American community, would not be given an hour on Fox News or some other conservative platform to, to talk about, you know, black equality. And Joe Biden, for example. Yet Joe Budden, the Breakfast Club, and probably some other play, other platforms are going to now do the same thing. Sometimes we do some really nonsensical stuff as a group of people. Candace Owens, with all the stuff that she has said and done to the African-American community, should not be given any platform to try to convince black people to support white supremacists, white, white conservatives who are committed to making America great again. Where was it ever great for black Americans? All right, that's where I'll stop. I am attorney Augustus Corbett one half of the defiant lawyers and each and every week we bring you this type of content so that you will not be bamboozled misled by the likes of candace owens and and tim scott and uh byron donaldson and 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 others all right so like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell so that you'll get notified when we upload one of our videos. Thank you. God bless you. Peace.